there's a major event coming soon on British television that's just too important for some people to miss. G'day. I'm Paul Hogan. I've just slipped up here from down under to ensure that all my uh, personal friends are tuned into Channel 4 when they kick off on the 2nd of November. She's right. Um, which way is the, the palace from here? The Paul Hogan Show is just part of a brand new package of entertainment coming your way when Channel 4 takes to the air on November the 2nd. Dear, listen to this. Oh, no, I'll tell you another one. Now, don't go away. You're going to like this one. It's really funny. Ah, there's an Englishman and an Irishman and a Scots. Dreadful, ghastly. Give me the parsley. Stir it, mix it. This ought to fix it. Add a bit of milk. Look, smooth as silk. You see, ham need never be the same again. Because as soon as you pour the sauce from Nor, it'll entertain. Whenever your food gets boring, get gnawing. At Unitile Kitchen and Bathroom Superstores, you'll find over 50 superb displays to choose from. So there's always more choice and style at Unitile. Handymen can create high-quality kitchens and bathrooms at Unitile's cash-and-carry prices. Or the Unitile Kitchen Planning Department can quote for your complete installation, including tiling, plumbing and electrics, carried out by craftsmen. Visit your local Unitile Superstore at Aldridge, Burton-on-Trent and Derby. Not surprisingly, one of the world's most sophisticated electronic washing machines is Acreda. Microprocessors make the best possible use of temperature, wash times, and other variables. Each of its nine wash programs corresponds exactly with the International Textile Care Labeling Code, so whatever you're washing, it's washed correctly. As you can see, Creda have made washing foolproof. Creda. Brilliant, but simple. One stop, one stop. The Redditch Kingfish is only one stop, one stop. For all the stores you want in one stop, one stop. All undercover and only one stop. Redditch Kingfisher Shopping Centre. 150 big name stores with easy parking all under one roof. One stop. Redditch Kingfisher Shopping Centre. One stop shop. Alfred Hitchcock's fantasies of sex and violence terrified the world on screen. Now the Daily Mail reveals how close they came to his own life. What secret compulsion made him humiliate stars like Joan Fontaine? How did Grace Kelly handle his obsessions? One star became pregnant to escape his clutches. He put another in fear of her life. The dark side of Hitchcock was as frightening as any of his films. Read The Evil Genius, starting tomorrow, only in the Daily Mail. This is what it feels like to sit on the stuffy old 815 with the sun in your hair. Or be stuck in the dirt and fumes of a traffic jam with the sun in your hair. There are four Sun Silk shampoos to wash the everyday world clean out of your hair and leave your hair beautiful and full of sun. Wouldn't you like to spend every day with the sun in your hair? What's new at Allied? Curtains at Allied. Over 2,000 superb savings on list prices. Savings to take away. Velvets, just £3.99 a yard. Savings to hang today. Curtains for new rooms. Old, bold and bright rooms. Curtains for budgets big or small. Allied for curtain for you. Good evening. I'm here to invite you to join us for more snooker from Derby. Tonight we complete our coverage of the Jameson International Open, the tournament that is second only in importance to the World Championship. And today's final is between David Taylor, who beat Steve Davis in this championship, and Tony Knowles, who beat Davis in the Worlds. And the play this afternoon has been everything you would expect of a final like this. Join us for the climax this evening, later on, on ITV. <laughs> Thank you, Dickie. Don't forget there's a programme which isn't billed in TV Times which follows the snooker. That's at 12 o'clock. We'll be looking at the Falklands Gallantry Awards. So it's the snooker at half past ten, the final action from Derby, the Gallantry Awards at midnight. First, though, the national and international news from ITN. <laughs>
Prince Charles joins in the bid to save the Mary Rose. The widow of Colonel HVC says he died doing something worthwhile. A special recruit in the rehearsal for the Falklands Victory Parade and the rugby stars playing for a young man's future. Good evening. Prince Charles has joined the diving team who are battling to raise the wreck of the Tudor warship Mary Rose by tomorrow morning. The Prince says any further hitch could be disastrous and would mean the whole operation being postponed for at least a fortnight. Today's attempt had to be abandoned because of damage to the lifting frame. Norman Rees has been with the salvage team throughout the day. This is what Prince Charles had hoped to see today, the hull of the Mary Rose breaking the surface of the Solent. The dark timbers of the wreck, shadowed by its yellow lifting frame, had been brought briefly to the top during the night, giving ITN these first exclusive pictures of the hull above the water after four and a half centuries. At this stage, things appear to be going well, and the main lift looks set for this morning. But by dawn, divers had found a problem. One of the legs on the lifting frame had buckled, and the structure wasn't ready to support the Mary Rose during the main lift. So Prince Charles arrived on what should have been an historic day with little for him to see. Morale among the recovery team was at rock bottom, though officials of the trust did their best to put a brave face on things. We fought wind and weather and now we've got a technical problem which the experts are dealing with and they will solve it for us. Uh, we like what we've got down there, we will recover it soon. How big a disappointment was it today? Well it's not a disappointment for us because we're just doing a job of work. Ultimately, we'll finish that task. It's a disappointment for all these people out here, these lovely people who've come to see her come up, and my heart aches for them. Thousands of people in a variety of boats had crowded the Solent to see the wreck, and Prince Charles set out through the flotilla to try to lessen their disappointment. On one vessel, passengers had paid 80 pounds a head for a ringside seat, so Prince Charles climbed onto one of them to explain that at least the wreck was safe. All the telltale uh, devices to show whether any strain is coming on the hull or not, all remain completely unaffected. So in fact, it looks as though the hull of the Mary Rose is much stronger than anything else around here. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, at the sight of the Mary Rose, divers were modifying the rest of the lifting structure to accept the added strain and cutting away the damaged section. Prince Charles, by this time, had decided to see the problem for himself and made his tenth dive on the wreck since he became president of the Mary Rose Trust. It was a gesture that acted as a major boost to morale to a team that has laboured in appalling conditions for 17 years to try to retrieve the wreck. He spent ten minutes with one of the Trust's professional divers looking at the damaged section. When he emerged, I asked him what he'd been able to see. I'm afraid it is very cloudy today, unfortunately, but, um, oh, I don't know, it's, uh, what was that? <laughs> Lord, sorry, anyway. No, it was, um, interesting, but it's quite difficult to tell what it all is, I mean, it's just the odd shape you could make out, really. And even more full of admiration for those people who find their way around down there, that's the incredible thing. Does it look to you, sir, as if the problem can be solved and that the wreck can be brought up? No, I'm not an engineer, nor have I dived here permanently, so I couldn't tell us from going down there, but from what we've been discussing today, there's, there's a very good chance. Well, we've got to do it, so... You, you saw no signs of damage, obviously? Um, no, not really. No, no signs None of damage at all. at all. But in fact, with the, only the top timbers are beginning to get a bit squidgy. But that is always the problem, I think, isn't it? The ones on the, that have been exposed longest. Well, the ones that start rotting soonest. That's the only problem. You've been in on all the discussions today. Are you happy about the projected time of uh, recovery, possibly tomorrow morning, we gather? Well, I, one should never um, count one's chickens before they're hatched, should you? But um, there's obviously there's a great deal of uh, will, will and determination to get it up tomorrow. Otherwise, this goes away. That's right. I gather you're going to stay with it until she comes up. Oh, yes. Well, I might go back and have a bath and then come here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Prince Charles's personal commitment to this project was underlined tonight when he asked if there was anything at all he could be doing to help speed up the recovery of the Mary Rose. 
So tomorrow, as the race against time continues, he could well be seen working alongside the archaeologists, divers and engineers here to help conclude this historic salvage. What King Henry VIII, who saw this Tudor warship founder here in 1545, would have made of all this, unfortunately, we will never know. Norman Rees, ITN, at the site of the Mary Rose. The widow of Colonel H. Jones, one of the two VCs of the Falklands campaign, said today she believed her husband died doing something worthwhile. Colonel Jones of the Parachute Regiment died as he charged an Argentine machine gun nest which was holding up his men's advance at Goose Green. Obviously I'm very proud, um, but I think I'm more pleased for the, for the children. I think it's super for them and for the family and friends um, and for the regiment. I think more than for myself. How keen was H to go with the task force? Oh, I mean, once he knew that there was something going on, I mean, he wanted to be there where, the, where it was happening. Um, he'd be miserable if he'd been left behind, I think, like most soldiers. Uh, he wanted to be in on the action. Londoners have had a preview of Tuesday's victory parade for the heroes of the Falklands campaign. Sleepy London came to life at 8 o'clock this morning to the thunder of tanks, armoured vehicles, seven bands and 200 pairs of boots. It was a sight to fill you with pride, even though on Tuesday a thousand more Falkland veterans would be on parade amid tight security. Today, yards of tape filled the gaps as servicemen meticulously went through this dress rehearsal. A few early risers turned out to watch and one patriotic spectator decided to join in despite being too young to understand what happened in the South Atlantic. His big day came to an end when Dad sounded the retreat. In all, the parade will last just half an hour, but as the Prime Minister says, a chance for London and the rest of the country to pay tribute to the task force. Terry Lloyd, ITN, in the City of London. Well, I don't know if the little chap will be there, but there's live coverage of the parade at 12.30 on Tuesday on ITV. ITN's special coverage of the Falklands Gallantry Awards was broadcast last night because so many newspapers and radio stations had revealed names before the official announcement. So instead of the half hour planned for midnight tonight, there'll be a five minute summary, although it will contain some material not seen before. The leader of the Roman Catholic Church in Poland, Cardinal Glemp, told his countrymen today they had to face reality and live through their bitterness at the military government's suppression of solidarity. Cardinal Glemp said the ban had caused acute pain, but we still know that what is just and embraces an ideal and contains invincible good cannot perish. In Rome, the Pope said the ban was a violation of fundamental rights. He was speaking after the canonization of a Polish priest killed in a Nazi concentration camp. It was a very special Polish occasion, the canonization of a Polish priest by a Polish Pope in front of thousands of pilgrims who'd flown in from Warsaw for the occasion. Father Maximilian Kolbe has been a symbol of martyrdom ever since he gave his life in the concentration camp of Auschwitz so that another man might be spared. Today, that other man, 82-year-old Francis Gajovnicek, was in St. Peter's to see John Paul confer sainthood on the man who gave his life for him in 1941. It should have been a celebration, but it wasn't. No one here, least of all John Paul, could celebrate such an event after the banning of solidarity. For the Pope, that has come as a particularly cruel blow. He has staked a great deal of the prestige and the power of his papacy on defending the trade union. But months of diplomacy from the Vatican, which has sought a dialogue with both sides in Poland, has been so clearly rebuffed by General Jaruzelski. Furthermore, John Paul himself has come under some criticism from within his church for spending too much time on Poland and not enough on other countries where the church is in dispute with the regime. The result, the critics say, is a devaluation of his power. Today, there was no mistaking the Pope's sadness and emotion as he appealed for the reinstatement of solidarity. The fact is, a number of senior figures in the Vatican believe the church has suffered something of a defeat over Poland because their Polish Pope has asked but not received the hearing he expected. Two men died when their helicopter plunged to the ground and exploded in flames at Dice Airport near Aberdeen. Airport firemen poured hundreds of gallons of foam onto the burning wreckage near the runway lights but were unable to save the crew. The pilot, Captain Ben Caesar, a married man with three children, and his co-pilot, Mr Christopher Gaunt, were on a training flight. No one else was on board. 
40,000 Sikhs marched through central London as part of their campaign against a controversial ruling by Lord Denning that they are not a racial group. A public school in the Midlands refused to admit a Sikh teenager because he wore a turban. But Lord Denning ruled that the case was not in breach of the Race Relations Act. At Downing Street, the marchers handed in a petition containing 80,000 signatures. Finally, a medical student paralysed last year in a rugby accident has been watching a match that could determine his future. Stephen Duckworth is determined to complete his studies, so to raise the money he needs, his rugby club at Guy's Hospital in London brought in a team of star players. Today, Stephen Duckworth has to watch the game he loves from the sidelines. Twelve months ago on this ground, he fell and broke his neck during a training match for Guy's Hospital first team. Stephen was a third-year medical student. After months of agonising treatment at Stoke Mandeville Hospital, he can move one arm, but he's paralysed from the waist down. His rugby career may be over, but he's determined to be a doctor. Well, it's hard for any medical student going through medical school, but uh, obviously there are going to be certain restrictions now for me, but uh, hopefully I'll manage to cope with them. To raise the money Stephen will need, Guy's arranged a rugby festival. Its star was the former Welsh skipper J.P.R. Williams, an orthopaedic surgeon, and his international medics 15. And having a doctor on call has its advantages. Unhappily, injuries like Stephen's are becoming more common, but Williams thinks they can be avoided. Uh, the survey that I did, they, they tend to happen at the beginning of the end of the season, when, really? when A, the people are less fit, and B, the grounds are harder. Mm. And, uh, and technique is vitally important, and it happens in, in the younger right. player who is in, inexperienced. You know, and uh, you know, it really does put a lot of pressure on international uh, forwards to not collapse the scrums, because if kids see that happening at national level, then they're going to copy it. Now Stephen has just two years to win his own personal match and that coveted medical degree. Lindsay Charlton, ITN, South London. I'll be back at midnight with that roundup of the Falklands Awards. Until then, a very good evening to you.